we have Emily Iannacone from the PIF program, Presidential Innovation Fellows, a program established by the White House in 2012 to bring the principles and values of the innovation economy into our government. The PIF program pairs talented, diverse technologists and innovators with civil servants and federal agencies to bring expertise and experience and practice from the private sector and the startup community into government, a very different way of, for the government to work. They tackle some of the nation's biggest challenges. We are fortunate to have Emily here, a social impact designer and design researcher who began her career as a visual designer and writer. Her early training focused on youth experience trauma in Baltimore and the impact of chronic stress and education. She's been working with us on a series of child welfare projects to prevent child abuse and neglect and to improve the foster care experience. She's got a partnership with Scooter in DC that she's gonna be talking about, which is very exciting. Sixto Cancel, CEO of Think of Us, a nonprofit he established to leverage technology, data, and multimedia to break down the barriers he experienced while growing up in foster care. Cancel has been recognized by the White House as a White House champion of change and millennial maker by BET, recognized as one of the top 24 change makers under 24 in the country by the Campaign for Presidential Youth Council. He's a national voice advocating for youth aging out of foster care a tireless advocate of fixing a system that has failed so many young men and women. He's the type of person you want to be around all the time. You want him on your team because his energy and his commitment to fixing this system is so contagious. I know you love when people introduce you as the most magical person in the universe, but that's exactly how I want to introduce Sixto all the time. But speaking of magical people, I asked Scooter how I should introduce him, and he said, just call me Superman. And I said, if you wear a cape, I'll do it. But he didn't wear a cape. So this is uh, Kevin Scooter Ward, Deputy CIO for the DC's Child and Family Services Agency. His career in technology began in the private sector nearly 20 years ago. And he's taken what he learned in the private sector into DC's Child Welfare Agency. He leads the agency's push for a more innovative technology posture includes the development of an app designed for older youth and foster care, and a complete redesign of DC's SACWA system or its CWIS system faces. I invited Bill Brantley to this panel as well. Bill Brantley has not been in the child welfare space, but he has been in the space of innovation and facing and working with cultures and people that are not sure how to innovate or they don't want to innovate, tackling the, the process of change, introducing concepts like Agile and Lean Management, something he teaches at the University of Maryland, along with communication skills, project management. He's spent most of his career working on helping agencies and nonprofits and groups become more agile and healthy and responsive and adaptive to change. He moderates the Agile Lean Listserv, which is something any of you with a .gov or a .mil email can subscribe to, and it has become my source of required reading every morning at work, because everything he posts about how to overcome a resistant culture, how to innovate, how to work with somebody, how to do this and that, he posts just the most excellent material. He's an active blogger, blogging about how to reinvent government, how organizations fail and succeed, and what it takes to promote a growth mindset and overcome resistance to change, something he'll be talking about. I'd like to turn attention to you. How many of you right now are able to pick up your phones and open up an app that tells you the whereabouts or the outcomes or anything related to the kids that you work with? Three. Okay. How many of you, if you go back to your office, you have a computer system that you can open up and it tells you Real, gives you real-time data on the young people that you're working with, back at your office at least. That's gotta be four. This is a real problem we have. We can track our pizza, we can track the history of everything we purchased on amazon.com, but why can't we understand exactly where on any given day 
the kids are that we're working with and the experiences they're going through. Why has that been so hard to achieve in our field? How many of you have the data and tools available to you to make you feel empowered to make the right decisions in your work? One or two or three? Four or five, great. Last question, how many of you in your agency or organization has an office or a division whose sole purpose is to give you a space to innovate and experiment and test out a new idea and hack red tape? I mean, that is the purpose of that office. How many of you in your agency have that? Zero. That's a problem, and that needs to change. That is changing in government. It changed with the introduction of the US Digital Service, which arrived on the field when a certain website failed rather publicly, healthcare.gov. And Obama brought in a team from people, a team of six people, one from Google, Mikey Dickerson, and said, fix this. This is really bad. And Dickerson came in with ideas from Google and what the private sector has been doing for years when it comes to developing software and websites working with a small, nimble teams, breaking down a massive project into small, discrete pieces, iterating quickly, getting small features of the website out fast, not the whole website out at the same time, testing all the time, getting it in front of users, helping the users actually build that, failing early rather than big, so he and his team had time to pivot and change. The idea behind the USDS was to institutionalize those practices he brought to government and make them a part of how government works all of the time. And the USDS was formed. They recruit top designers, engineers, product managers, experts, many from Google, Amazon, Facebook, Twitter. They pair them with civil servants similar to what the PIF program does. And they deploy these teams across government to fix some of the most high profile challenges we have. Why is it so hard for a veteran to get access to health care. Why does he or she have to go to 1,000 websites? There are more than 1,000 websites designed for veterans. USDS is merging that into one website, a website built for and by veterans. It's the kind of amazing work they do. It started off as a startup, and now they have teams across all the departments, health and human services, education, defense, veteran affairs. One of the co-founders, Haley Van Dyke, in her TED Talk. Imagine that, a government person doing a TED Talk. Things are changing. She described the USDS as a SWAT team meets Peace Corps. How many of you in your agency has a SWAT team meets Peace Corps that can swoop in and help you out? We all need these in our agencies. We have some here. 18F is one. Started soon after the successful rescue of healthcare.gov, a similar mission to the USDS. They're based in the general services administration. 18F is short for their address, 1800 F Street. That's very innovative. They could have come up with a really long, boring acronym like we all do. They said 18F sounds kind of hip and cool. Another group of technologists, designers, and researchers from around the country committed to making government services simpler and easy to use, partnering with agencies across the government, again, to bring in concepts that have worked so well in the private sector into government. One of the programs they host is the Presidential Innovation Fellows, which is exactly how we got Emily on board to work with us. The Idea Lab. This specifically is what I was thinking when I asked you if you have a group in your organization whose sole purpose is to help you innovate and experiment and give you the resources, space, and tools, and maybe some money that you might need. We have this at HHS. It's called the, the Idea Lab. And that's their sole purpose, is if you have an idea in government, if you want to do something new and different that's a little outside the box, you can apply, and, and if your idea is compelling enough, they'll sit down with you and they'll give you some money, they'll give you some help, they'll give you some air cover, and they'll give you the space to experiment and even fail. They will help you refine and test your idea, and if your idea is lousy, they will help you scrap it right away, rather than scrapping it a year later after you spend a lot of time on it. That is part of how we should be doing work. It's part of how we should be doing business. These are concepts of idea labs and innovation hubs, as they're often called, are starting to sprout up all over the country in every discipline, not just ours. Consider adding something like this in your organization, even if you are the only person who starts it. Consider starting it, creating a safe place to actually think and operate differently. How many of you 
Heard about the White House Foster Care Hackathon? It's amazing. Sponsored and hosted by Department of Health and Human Services, the White House, and think of us, thanks to Sixto, who inspired this idea. We brought for two days together child welfare practitioners and leaders and philanthropists and foster family and foster alumni from all over the country together in DC, as well as people from the tech sector, engineers and designers and coders who may not have had any exposure to child welfare and did, didn't at that point even really understand what foster care was all about. And we brought them all together for two days to talk about how we can hack child welfare and innovate and use technology to improve the outcomes of the kids and families. We also assembled seven hacking teams, one from Romania that flew in and said, you have less than 24 hours to hack and come up with something that you're gonna present at the White House tomorrow. And what we want you to do is we want this team to fix homelessness. We want you to come up with something that can help a homeless youth find resources, shelter, and employment and education opportunities. Go do that. We want you to come up with something that can help a mother who's dealing with substance use get the resources and treatment she needs right away. We had five other products like that and they hacked for 24 straight hours, lots of Red Bull, lots of pizza, and produced apps and solutions and tools, many of which are now being fully developed and going to scale. It was amazing what you could do in 24 hours because we think in terms of IT projects, this will take about five years. It doesn't have to be that way. You can think quick and small and iterate quickly, and that's exactly what we did at that hackathon, and that's exactly what we demonstrated is possible. We also used this event as a milestone to get government to work fast and make some differences and get some things on the table, including the announcement of new regs about the Comprehensive Child Welfare Information Systems, regs originally written 23 years ago that dictated and described how child welfare agencies would, should build their case management systems. Regs written before the iPhone was around, before social media was around. 23 years went by, we got those updated. A completely new approach that allows states to develop technology and systems in a more flexible, creative, useful way that can better serve the needs of caseworkers that use those systems and the families and children that are supposed to benefit from them. We announced $1 million worth of consulting services to states to help them procure agile travel, uh, child welfare data systems, to provide TA, user-centered design, open source technologies, again, things that have worked so well in the private sector, money to help states learn about these approaches and build their systems with these approaches in mind. An amazing announcement, a public-private coalition led by the state of California to end the digital d divide between the haves and have-nots, announcing that every transition-aged youth in foster care in California will get a laptop. <laughs> and that is happening now. This White House hackathon started here in DC and it has inspired a hackathon in Silicon Valley hasn't happened yet, it's coming up. Inspired Hackathon in Boston. New York mayor's office called us and said, we want to do something too. Inspired a hackathon in Philadelphia, a legal hack, sponsored by the National Association of Council for Children, a nonprofit dedicated to representing, giving free legal advice and representation for children. The time has come with this, these efforts to change what we're doing. We have the tech sector thinking about this, we have nonprofits thinking about this, we have philanthropists thinking about this, how can we innovate and change with and without technology and child welfare. All of this though requires doing things very differently, requires changing how we work, requires working smarter, working faster, requires unlearning habits and forming new ones, requires convincing the powers that be that there has to be a better way to do what we do and that change is hard. That's exactly why we are here today to talk about this. Alrighty. So I wanna um, start with the clicker. Um, 
you know, the first question I have for the panel is um, to simply tell us, tell them the work you're doing uh, the, in the innovation space, uh, the processes that you're going through, the challenges you're encountering, and some of the work that you're involved in. Uh, I think we're going to start with Emily. Great. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for being here today. Um, as Kurt mentioned, my background is in design, um, human-centered design, and visual design. Uh, and currently, I'm working on a team of PIFs with ACYF on um, a project to reimagine the child welfare experience. Um, so my colleagues, uh, Wendy and Pooja, um, are, uh, they come from not design backgrounds. Uh, Wendy comes from disaster relief, and Pooja uh, has experience with youth empowerment and international development. Um, but they've learned design through me and have been helping to facilitate design thinking workshops as we've gone through this process. Um, so I have a couple of definitions for you in case you're not familiar with um, some of the variances in design. Um, we've been using a human-centered design process for this project with ACYF. Uh, and human-centered design is basically designing with the people that you're designing for. Um, so whether that's a product, a service, a process, an experience, um, every step of the way, you're engaging um, the end user and figuring out uh, through building empathy how you can add utility to their lives through what you're creating. Um, so it's constantly looking for input from them. Experience design is a focus on um, how something is used uh, by the person who is using it. And then service design is looking at um, all the different factors that go into creating a service. Um, to improve it for the people who are using it and improve the, the quality of the interaction between these service providers and their customers. Um, so human-centered design is used in uh, a lot in the government right now, um, and it's, it's only growing. Um, so Kurt brought up a lot of uh, great examples of different places that are doing innovative work. Um, there's also a collaboratory at the State Department where they have um, designers in residence there and people who are working on agile technology. Um, there's also Veterans Affairs Center for Innovation, um, and they're doing a lot of work to improve the veteran experience. So we are looking at this project um, through the lens of how to improve um, the, the child welfare experience for youth and families and keep it very youth and, and family-centered. Um, so with human-centered design, there are basically four parts of the, the process. Um, there's user research, so you are um, listening to stakeholders and... Um, basically asking a lot of questions and observing their behavior, um, seeing if what they're saying lines up with um, how they're behaving, uh, and doing a lot of analysis. And then um, after that, there's synthesis. So you, you take what you've heard and what you've seen, and you really analyze that. Uh, and then ideation is conceptualizing and coming up with um, solutions to some of the problems that you're addressing. And then prototyping is, again, working with um, the, the people that you're designing for to create uh, rapid prototypes of things that could pen potentially solve the problem. Um, so we started with user research. Uh, we went across the country and we met with five different child welfare agencies. Um, we went on two ride-alongs, one in Los Angeles, one in DC. We spoke with um, all different stakeholders in child welfare at these design thinking workshops that we did, um, attended the, the foster care hackathon, and we actually had a prototype that we produced for the hackathon um, as, as one of the teams involved. Uh, which I'll show towards the end of this, um, and attended one of the interoperability conferences to learn a little bit more about how folks are getting systems to communicate with each other better. So in these design thinking workshops, um, we engaged all the, the child welfare stakeholders. So we had foster youth alumni, um, uh, biological uh, families, we had um, foster families, we had um, staff members from all different levels, um, and we had a lot of really in-depth conversations with them um, to talk about what some of the, the needs were, what some of the biggest challenges were. Uh, and then we did some rapid brainstorming with them to see what kind of solutions we could produce together. Um, and through, through all the research that we did um, for the last couple of months, we came up with three pretty major insights that you may be familiar with. Um, the first of which is that uh, the current implementation of the system is really not providing youth and families with the support and skills um, 
that they need coming out of it. Uh, and the second is that um, compliance is often prioritized over well-being. Um, and the third is that there is a lot of innovation that's happening in child welfare, but there are duplicate efforts here and there because it's not all connected. Um, so then we moved into ideation and we started to talk about what we could do to address some of these things and um, came up with a couple of prototypes. So the first one is uh, actually one that we're working on right now with um, Scooter Award and a task force at CFSA here in DC, um, which is to really map out what the experience is like through the lens of a foster youth going through the foster care system, um, as well as the family. Uh, actually, it came up yesterday in one of the task force meetings that oftentimes the youth and um, family really get separated and sort of um, polarized, and it's really good to look at them as one unit. So while we are looking at this through the perspective of youth, we will be incorporating a lot more on the family itself. Um, but basically, we looked at, um, you know, before a child enters the system to intake, to placement, to permanency, and we'll be adding post-permanency as well, because as we're working on this with the task force at CFSA, we're really um, starting to build out and validate some of these things and make sure that it's as accurate as possible as far as developing some universal touch points um, through the foster care experience that um, we can identify. So we map out these journey points um, through the different stages in the system, as well as identifying um, what some of the feelings of the, the youth and families are, as well as behavioral drivers, you know? So like finding a deeper understanding of, you know, what they could be feeling at each critical moment, and then what's driving any, any behavior, as well as how we can optimize safety, permanency, and well-being for them and really prioritize well-being over just compliance and make sure that we're building in um, the opportunity for youth and families to have more skills and support. So are we helping youth to um, become more autonomous and learn decision-making skills and become more independent and self-sufficient? Um, and, and actually, Sixto is doing a lot of really incredible innovative work around that, um, which he'll talk about next. Um, but we wanted to look at the, the system really holistically and see, you know, what are the different journey points along the way um, and how can we optimize well-being as well as some of the other things. So this is a, a very draft version of the map right now. Um, so we're working with our task force there and having some really great conversations and we'll also be producing um, a digital prototype version. So it will have the downloadable um, PDF of the map as well as a digital experience where you can walk through and really get an in-depth in -depth content. Um, and so far, you know, we've identified different ways that this could be used as far as um, helping with training, uh, staff, as well as um, potential foster families, um, and helping to make uh, some big picture budget decisions. So, you know, if you're looking at uh, facing budget cuts, you can sort of prioritize what is going to be best for well-being for youth and families. Um, and then we are creating a second prototype, uh, and this is something that came out of the foster care hackathon, um, which is, uh, so we mentioned that there's a lot of innovation that's happening, but it's, it's in silos. There is a lot of really cool technology that's being produced, um, but there's no place where it's all being sort of um, stored together. So we're creating a child welfare um, technology product hub that will eventually live on childwelfare.gov. Um, and this will uh, feature a lot of the innovative um, child welfare technology. So um, different apps, uh, and you will be able to filter through based on um, who the intended audience is for it. Uh, so this is um, a draft version of that as well. The code is currently being built, um, but both of these prototypes are expected to launch at the end of September, which we're very excited about. Um, so just to reiterate, the three big lessons that we learned from this is that um, we want to give children and families more skills and support when they leave the system than they had coming into it, so really work on strengthening that um, and the independence and self-sufficiency skills. Um, aligning uh, compliance, um, government compliance requirements with that well-being and safety and permanency is super important. And then um, being more proactive about connecting um, the child welfare innovators. So not even just with technology, but like, you know, taking the time to look at who's doing innovative work on, you know, organizational change um, and uh, some of the other, the other bigger things that are needed 
and um, maybe mapping out, you know, like who's working on what and seeing where efforts can be joined and where there are opportunities to start new things. So that's what PIF has been up to recently. Thanks. Thank you, Emily. Thank you. Can you, can you go back to the foster experience map? Mm -hmm. Because this is, I, th I think, something that's very amazing and incredible about this project and the map, and I don't think it's clear because the print is so small. Do you recall some of those bubbles in the middle are the experience a foster youth might have had, and there are quotes or, or moments in time that a child is experiencing that defines this whole map. Some of them I read, it's very sad reading um, because it really puts you into the shoes of that kid. And so one of those bubbles says something like, I'm in court now, what's gonna happen? And so the idea of user-centered design, I never realized this, is about promoting and building empathy. Designing the iPhone started with building empathy with people who are gonna use it. Redesigning the veteran's website to make sure vets can get access to the care starts with understanding the pain and the stories they have and how hard it's been for them to get access to care. It is no different in our system. We must develop empathy for the children and the youth and the families that have gone through this broken system to understand what did not work for them. Because only once we know that can we actually build a better product, a service, a tech, whatever it is. And user-centered design, to me, what I've learned is about building that empathy and helping teach a judge, for example, that what this child is experiencing right now is he has no idea who you are and you're about to change his life. Can you pause for a moment and ask him some questions about who he is? It is about empathy, and that's the only way we can actually produce a better experience for these youth, and I think this map is, is part of that. Thanks, Kurt. I forgot I actually have a quote, too. Um, one of the, I think, most revelatory moments came when we were at DC for our first research session, and we were talking to a foster youth alumni there, and um, someone had brought up trauma, and he responded, and he was like, y'all talk about how traumatized we are, but it's the system that does it. Um, it does everything for us and doesn't teach us how to do anything ourselves, and it really handicaps us, and that's why so many of us end up homeless. And that was kind of like a big aha moment. And, it was, and he was talking to um, different social workers. Like, it was a whole group of, of people. So there were social workers, there were some technologists, um, and other, other staff members there, and they were kind of floored by that. So that was something that we really paid attention to from that point on when we spoke with foster youth, and it came up again and again and again as a common theme. So. Thank you. Thanks. So six though. So I don't have anything to click, <coughs> but I'll leave the map up. Okay. Um, so a lot, of the same, a, lot of the, a lot of the same techniques that um, the Presidential <coughs> Innovation Fellows or some of the same things that we're doing and I say, you know, our user, um, our user research really starts with a lot of us who have, uh, in the company, who have had personal experience from a different perspective, a personal connection. So me personally, I grew up in the foster care system, entered at 11 months, by the age of six was placed back, nine adopted by a crazy racist woman. Um, so by 13, I was couch surfing. And at 15, I re-entered foster care. And this is where I came back to foster care um, and I went to a youth board meeting and it was not to be an advocate. It was because I was pretty darn mad. Um, and so I had a, a complaint to cash in. And here's where I really started to, do, to, to, to learn how to advocate and to learn some of the issues. And it came to the point where um, at you know, sophomore year of college, I started Think of Us. And Think of Us is really focused on technology, data, and multimedia. But anybody who knows me knows that I love policy and practice. Um, so why in the world am I in tech? And it really begins with the idea that when we think about where is the biggest potential of overhauling the system, of really changing practice, it, it boils down to the software that workers use every single day. How many of you are sick of spending more than half of your time writing reports? I like this corner of the back room over here. Y'all shot up your hands so quick. <laughs> you should be sitting up here. <laughs> um, and. A bit of that, you know, so, so there are so many tools that dictate the way of how we do things, why we do things, what needs to be reported. And some of you, how many of you feel like you're wasting some of your time sometimes? Okay, so this side of the room did better this time. There must be somebody's boss over here. Right. <laughs> right. So 
think of us has been focused on really thinking about what are the tools that every bucket needs. So what are the tools that the child welfare system needs? What are the, what are the tools that young people need? And what are the tools that people who are providing care foster parents, biological parents, and so on. And so we started with one application called Unify. And Unify really is about helping every young person reach their potential by allowing them to set the goals for their case plan, right? So too many times we act, we, we, bring, we bring young people to the table and we talk about them as if they're not there. And one of our observations, um, we were in a court, we, we were in court, we were, we were observing 11 different cases, and it was crazy to me that as I sat there, um, you know, we, we, were, we were watching the judges and the 11 different adults talk about the young person as though if they were not there, and then the judge goes to the young person, do you have anything to say? And the question, the answer was, hell no. I just heard 11 different reports about what I'm not doing, A, B, C, and D, I'm pissed, and the rest of it. Don't tell the commissioner I used that word. Um, He's back there. Right? Okay. No, just... So there, you know, to me, I look, at, I look at how the system is structured, and it really is not structured to be developmentally appropriate. When we think about what is adolescence about, in 2011, Jim Case Youth Opportunity Initiative came out with research around the adolescent brain. Before, we used to believe that between zero and six, you had this um, flexibility to learn, plasticity in the brain, um, where, you can, where you can learn at a significant rate, right? And that really set the tone for life. But in 2011, what came out was that during adolescence, there is this actual similar um, stage of plasticity in the brain, this flexibility to learn, where you can rewire your brain. And the way to rewire your brain is through the experiences. And the more that you experience something, the stronger those pathways become in your brain. So when we talk about how is it that we, how is it that the system, how is it that families, how is it that our society um, make sure that we are developing young people into healthy, stable, thriving adults, it boils down to some of the experiences and the developmental opportunities that happen during adolescence. And newsflash, our system does not do a great job of providing um, some developmental opportunities for young people. Instead of empowering young people to be part of their case plans and really lead the voice and prepare them to be there, sometimes we don't see that as much. Um, you know, we have, now with the, with the normalcy bill passing, we've taken a step to, to really increase the normal activities that are developmentally appropriate. So Unify is an app that helps young people set goals, helps them build teams around um, each of those goals. And when they add an adult to help them with that goal, it's not only the adults who are in the system, but it's also adults who are in their personal network. Because every young person has adults that they can start to bring into, um, in, into the conversation. Unfortunately, sometimes our system has institutionalized young people so much that we sometimes have severed some of those relationships, and now it is our job to go back to, to figuring out how is it that we help young people reconnect with some of those adults. Part of our other work is really to do the advocacy on the front end of figuring out how is it that we bring child welfare into the 21st century. And a lot of that started off with um, this idea about a year and a half ago, which is what if we had the first ever national hackathon? And I can tell you people thought we were crazy um, when we first started to uh, um, brainstorm around this idea. The idea that we can actually get people who were in leadership roles in Silicon Valley and the tech community to pay attention to what's going on with us. And what we got was an overwhelming response of we are from, from the tech community that we are here to help. We want to help solve this problem. Now let us, um, l l l l let us through the doors. And we can talk a little bit later about what are some of the challenges we've seen as we started to think about technology and child welfare. But I figure I'll, I'll, I'll let Scooter speak a bit. Thank you, so. I'm just going to say this out loud. I hate following Sixto because it's <laughs> just so good at what he does. Um, well, the truth is I hate following you. So <laughs> on purpose. So, um, my name <laughs> My name is Scooter Ward. Um, I am a grown man who goes by Scooter. And <laughs> one, of, one of, I'm going to go back to this slide. One of the things that, um, just a little bit of personal story. My husband and I adopted, we've adopted twice now from DC, uh, Child and Family Services Administration. And when I made a decision to leave the private sector, it was to come into some sort of service. Um, 
And once uh, the opportunity presented itself at CFSA, I couldn't pass it up. So I, I'm there. Uh, there's a few CFSAers out there, former and current, and I think they know I sort of came in like a tornado, or I hate to use the analogy, but like a wrecking ball. And so I just made some decisions, and one of the things that I really wanted to focus on was bringing technology to people rather than keeping it between people. Um, one of, I mean, we all have our SACWIS systems, our CWIS systems, our internal systems within our agencies, and those are what they are, and we're working towards making those more user-friendly and things like that. But there are these intermediate systems that still need to touch the worker, but every time along the way, I was figuring out we aren't doing things to touch our other constituencies, our foster parents, and more importantly to me, our youth. Um, and one of the things, and I'll get to it at the end of my myriad of slides here, is a youth-based app that we're going to be launching later this fall that is for older youth that really empowers them with the information that the agency already has. And it's really important to be able to do that. And I came up with the idea sitting with one of the uh, former youth who's now an, was an intern and now an employee at the agency. And he would always just come and sit in my office. And I would just be working away. <laughs> and I would just sort of like look over, yes. And he would just, no, I'm just here. And, and we, I would continue to work. And so one day I just like, well, why do you just come and sit in here? And he's like, because you like, you're working and you're working so hard to get these things done. And you have these two kids and you adopted from the agency. And we would build this relationship and we'd continually talk. And what I figured out is it wasn't about me working. It wasn't about uh, the fact that I'd necessarily adopted two children. It was about just the art of me being proximate, just being there and being interested and listening to this person. And he said, if we just had something that could help us in a similar way to having the foster parent app or having the uh, mobile visualization of our SACWA system, that's not the word he used, that's just what I use because I'm a nerd. <laughs> um, that if we had those things for us, it could really help. And I suspect it's the same youth that Emily was talking about, who was like, you know, I don't know how, um, as, a, as a youth who's aged out of care, I don't know how to go get an electric, you know, sign up for electric at my house. I don't know how to sign a lease. I don't know what any of that is. And these are things that we need to navigate in ways that really help our youth. So, my sort of charge has been we can work the technology in the agency because agencies, just like most things, become these large bureaucracies. And we sort of have inadvertent, not purposeful, inadvertent fiefdoms. And like, I need to fix this particular thing so I don't have to do six spreadsheets to do this. And those of you who are CFSAers or others in the audience, Megan's nodding her head right here because she knows what my next answer is. My next answer, my next question is, how many kids will that help? What is the process that then benefits children at the end of this? Because I can spend some money solving this technological problem that helps you get you know, from six spreadsheets to one, but is it really going to benefit us on the end? Are, you, are we gonna be able to have more workers in the field spending more time with families, spending more time with youth, spending more time at schools? And if the answer to that is no, then we try to scale back and rework a solution. Maybe the process is broken. And there have been a lot of things that I've done at the agency, that's Sixto's version of clapping, by the way. <laughs> a lot of things at the agency that I've done that have just been process changes to allow people to think, okay, you, just because you've always done it this way doesn't mean it needs to continue to be done this way. Um, you know, one of my mentors always says, the best of what you've done has gotten you to exactly where you are. And if that is not where you want to be, let's adjust what you're doing. So I'm gonna go through our myriad of mobile apps here and just sort of talk through them. There are a lot of slides and I apologize for that. But one of the things, you know, I put meeting the needs by meeting the people. So on the left is our little uh, blue uh, icon we use for our M Faces and Foster Parent app, which are the first two I'll talk about. And then over on the right is something I'm very excited about that we're gonna be launching in the, later this fall that those of you who are from CFSA have not seen yet. So I'm very excited about it. So 
our SACWIS system is called FACES, and it is the many faces of FACES. <laughs> Depending on what part of the agency you're in, you use different parts of it. If you're in accounting, you use one part. If you're in legal, you have to use other parts. But if you're a caseworker, it is literally where you live and breathe. I mean, how many of you sit in your SACWIS systems and are just like, if I could stop typing this report and just be out in the field, I could probably impact a lot more of these children. And those are probably not the words you use. It's probably late, <laughs> laced with profanity or whatever else, or uh, you know, frustration words, um, as my younger son calls them. Um, he's like, oh, dad used a frustrated word. Um, <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> um, so um, so this, this particular app here, what, it, what it's showing in this visualization is this is this worker's cases. So they have four cases here. They then bring a case into focus and shows in that one case there are 12 different clients. And that could mean, you know, two sets, you know, parents or whatever else and eight kids or just a mix of different people and all of these other things. But what it's doing is allowing them to have this information in their hand and move forward in a way that they don't have to constantly go back to the office or write something down or crack open a laptop. I remember when we first met with one of our social workers, she was completely awesome but spent a lot of time on her laptop in the meeting and we just felt very disconnected. And as we launched sort of the, the, this app, which launched before I arrived but has made some changes since then, it has really helped in those of our caseworkers who use it a lot because now they're able to see, okay, I can talk to all these, these are the families I need to talk to this week. I can do my working planning. It's right here in front of me. It's almost like a calendar on your um, smartphone. But some other things that they talked about is, when I'm in a neighborhood I'm not necessarily familiar with, I don't know where stores are, I don't know where gas stations are, I don't know what's a safe place to do this. So we put this in the app. If for these four places, particularly the first one is what we center on, these are the gas stations you can go to. These are the stores you can go to. Um, we're going to include restaurants and things like that. So then people aren't, they're, they're focused on what they need to be focused on rather than anxious in some cases about, okay, what's this other thing I need to do? Now, on the other side, for a while, we were like, how do we communicate with foster parents? Um, are, do we have any foster parents in the audience, by the way? All right. So I think those of us who are foster parents know that going through training, you're taught a whole bunch of things, and then you get a kid in your house, and everything goes out the window, right? Because, you know, we, we sort of train folks in the way of saying, this particular thing is what you need to do in this instance. But children aren't robots, they're not products, they're not something you buy and can call technical support if it breaks. They are, they're a person, right? And they live and they breathe. So this app is really a fundamental tool for those parents to say, okay, I don't need to call my social worker for these myriad of things. So um, those of you who have seen our app before can notice that this is an update to it. So in this instance, the parent would log into the app and they'd see these are the five children I have in my care. And then you can bring one of those children into focus and see their um, particular demographic information. And one of the things we always needed was our son's Medicaid number, either DC Medicaid or, you know, when was the last time they had an appointment? So these are some of the things that are in here. The other huge thing when you're a foster parent or about to become an adoptive parent and going through the process is licensure. So you have to figure out all these things. And within our app, we've built sort of a checklist. What do you, what do you need on household members, the, um, just in licensing in general, and what's your license information? So here you'll see the household members are all there. Then the next part talks about when folks FBI background checks and those kinds of things, CPR certification, when those expire. And in DC, you live or breathe by what your license number is. And we actually put this in the app and allows people the freedom to walk around and not be horribly concerned about, I don't know what this is, right? I, I need to email my social worker or call my family support worker to get this information. We've now empowered them with this information in their hand so when they do call their social worker or their family support worker, they're calling with a genuine question rather than 
what's my child's Medicaid number? I don't have this information. And as long as a parent's email is in our SACWA system, which we're working on getting them all in there, all of this data pre-populates. So the social worker doesn't need to do any extra work or the caseworker, the RDP worker, whomever is putting this in, doesn't need to do any extra work other than make sure the email is in there. And those of you who work in agencies know that's huge, right? I don't have to do anything more. In fact, I only need to do this one thing, then I'm done with it, and everything else I put in there updates. So that, that's huge. Um, this one is, uh, OIE is what we call the Office of Youth Empowerment in DC, and that's um, for youth 13 and above. Is that right? 16 and above. <laughs> um, sorry. Uh, I always say 13 for some reason, I don't know why. 16 and above, and we made an app for those folks, for the youth, this is a youth-based app that is youth-centered that will allow them to have similar information to the foster parent app, but even some other things, sorry, my phone's going crazy, um, even some other things that are important to them as well. So I'm gonna scroll through this. So what you have is their profile, their education, and I really wanna focus on education in the middle here for a second because I know some folks are uh, gonna geek out about this. It, it gives them deadlines that they probably only hear. The PSAT, SAT, ACT, ETV, you know, FAFSA, all of these kinds of things that they've probably just heard, but not really internalized. Now that information is constantly in front of them. They're getting push updates. They're getting all different kinds of information. And if they're not college bound, then they have a different set of information that's on the far right. Um, here, transitional care package, transitional document checklist, transitional toolkit, and those are for um, kids who are about to age out of care or transition out of care. Again, they have their mobile, um, they have their, I'm sorry, medical information, extremely important for youth who are independent, um, 18 plus or about to transition out of care. All of their information, their social security number, upcoming appointments, um, this is one we're really proud of. We've been able to put employment information in here. So if they want to sign up for job readiness training, they want to find a job, if they have career interest, they can literally go to different parts of the app. So here they're in the find a job section. They put, you know, these are the four things that I'm interested in or these are the four things that are available right now. Which of these would you like to apply to? And they can directly apply from the app if their information is in the database. This is a career interest form because I talk to a lot of the youth and, and you know, this is with any child, not just youth in care, and they're like, I want to be a veterinarian. I'm like, but you're afraid of dogs, so that's a problem, right? But what this, what this form does is then says, okay, you think you want to be in healthcare, have you finished high school? And then it just sort of takes them through step by step, much like Unify and some of the other things that Sixto's working on does, but it does it right here for these youth, so it's, again, proximate, right? Like it's right there for them, it's near them, they can touch it, they can feel it, and guides them through a process that adults have constantly told them about. I find with my 17-year-old, I can tell him all the time but if I get one of his friends to text him that information, magically it happens. So it, it is one of those things that we are, we are allowing these youth to be empowered with the information that we know they need and we sort of in the dark chasms of our agencies complain that why aren't they getting it and we're, we're empowering them to sort of do this themselves in a self-directed way. Another piece we have is community resources. In DC, we have a rapid housing program and some other things. I know that um, there are other nonprofits who are helping with housing and things like that across the nation. And this is one of those things that would give the information that that transitional youth needs in the app to sign up for the program, what the deadlines are, what are the requirements, um, if they have travel vouchers, their smart trip card, which is what we use here in DC when the Metro actually works. Um, it gives them their smart trip number. It gives them all the information. And this came about through joint conversation. It was originally sort of a brainchild that I had. And then joint conversations between Office of Youth Empowerment employees and transitional age youth who were like, if I just was able to find this out, I wouldn't have to call my caseworker 15 times a day. 
or I wouldn't have to depend on this adult to constantly feed me this information, which is really what the translation of that is, right? So now they have this information at hand. It then allows them to move on in a way that they weren't able to move on because they were waiting to be fed that information before. Again, transition planning. We're, we're using this app now to intervene earlier than, you know, your six months from transitioning out of care. It starts, you know, maybe a year or two earlier and talks about what you need to do in the process at each step of the way, all here in an app. You know, it's not a, an adult in your ear telling you that these things need to happen. Um, it gives you, it, it talks through finances. We're going to have a finance module in there to help with budgeting, life skills, jobs, everything that's listed here. Is this here. available for me, too? I, could <laughs> I mean, just I could benefit think about that. how great this would have been if, if all of us had it, right? right. And, and the last part, and, and I think very important, is who's on my team? Who are the people I can talk to about each one of these things? Extremely important. Because sometimes, we were speaking about this actually before we came out here, a youth may have 16 different workers during the course of them being in care, and they only know to call that first person. Because it's like, I remember the first teacher who really kicked me in the butt, Rebecca Rivers. You know, I remember her. She was my English teacher. And still to this day, when I ever have, like, something I really need to, like, get charged up about, I reach out to her. And it's almost like that first encounter with someone that they realize cares about them and is directed towards them is who they constantly go back to, not knowing that that person in the background may be talking to all these other people. And while that's positive, I know that for some people like myself, I have a lot of foster youth who call me, it can become overwhelming and then when I can't meet their needs, I feel bad. So we wanted to empower them also to know if what you need to know about is rapid housing, this is the person who's handling your rapid housing case. If you need to know about transportation, this is that person. And it gives all of those tools to them right there in their hand. And then the flip side of that is the responsibility on them factor. And those of you who've seen me interact with older transition age youth and some that I've hired is I'm like, what is the answer you think you have to this question? What do you have at hand that can help you find this answer? And this tool is that. And pushing them back to this is not necessarily as bad a thing as saying, go figure it out. It is, we have given you the tools. Now let's use them. Go forth and build. So that is what we're um, doing in DC. And um, hopefully we'll get to some questions about it. How many of you, um, how many of you have think an app like this could be useful for your agency or the families, the kids that, that you're working with, or even for your own work? Lots of hands. How many of you have something like this in your agency or that your kids have? <laughs> so that's what. That's why we're here. So why did so many hands go up when I asked, could this be useful? And why did only two hands go up when I asked, do you have this? Well, Kurt, something that alert like made me a little alarm was the fact that. At least half of y'all didn't answer, like raise our hands. So I, is there a way we can like someone tweet something? Like we, I want to know why folks made, matter of fact, my number is 203-685-0044. <laughs> For someone who didn't raise their hand, I would not track your number down, but you should text us um, why is it that you feel like it was, it's not something useful for your organization so that we can discuss that in Q&A. Mm -hmm. So I'm serious about 203, <laughs> I'm so serious, <laughs> 203. <laughs> 685-0044, feel free to text me. If you already have my number saved, then don't text me because I'm going to know it's so you. Six, this is live streamed across most of Earth. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this, is why, this is why you never return my text. Because everyone is texting you right. all the damn time. So, but I, I mean, let's find out who, who you are. Like, who's here today? Um, you know, who here is working in a child welfare agency? Because this may explain why some hands didn't go up. Yep. So who here is working in um, some sort of research or policy sort of capacity? Okay. Lots of people. Okay. So these researchers may not be working with the kind of youth in the way that Kurt, I feel better. agencies are working with. Yes. So, <laughs> um, that helps. Right, because you saw that, right? <laughs> but okay. the one thing that I think is great about this app and, um, is that, again, it involves youth actually to help build it. Because 
this is what was eye-opening to me, is the reason I got in this field in the first place is when I was doing residential treatment, working with kids in residential treatment who didn't have homes or who had been abused. And that's what got me into this field in the first place. And I met with them every single day. And I heard stories every single day. And I met with families and parents. And I said, you're about to have a new set of parents. Mm. So then I, I came to the government. And for five years, how many of those kids did I actually work with every day? Zero. For five years, I never worked or met with a foster kid while working on behalf of foster kids. That's a real problem. And so then I met Sixto. <laughs> and honestly, Sixto, you were the first foster kid, the first real kid that I'm supposed to be trying to help that came back into my life. Mm. and got me more excited and energized and back into this business. <laughs> and so when you hear this term user-centered design, it is a very real thing. It is a real thing about do not assume you know what you're doing is what the kids and families need. Because when you bring them to the table, you'll hear stories and you'll learn things that you could never have learned in your training or even in your own career and own experience. And that is when the innovation will happen. And that's what gives life to apps that are actually going to be useful for kids. That's what gives rise to all of the great work and the truly transformative work that we do is when you get the people that you're supposed to be working for in the table, in the room working with you. Bill. OK. Well, that was great. I mean really helps kind of segue into my talk here. And um, <clears throat> excuse me there. So as I was listening to him, I was trying to think about, you know, I'm not in the child welfare system or in the um, whole sphere of activity that y'all do, but I do have something in my past that relates to what you guys do. And it was actually my first experience in government. I was working, I was a, let's see, what year was I? Junior in um, college. So last year. Huh? Last year. Right? Last year, yeah. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much. <laughs> so anyway, I was a junior in college, summer internship at a public defender's office mm. in a small town in Kentucky called Richmond, Kentucky. And my first real job, first real government job. And it was a shock the first day I came there because I don't know if you all have, you probably have dealt with public defenders. At least you can imagine what it's like. Overwhelming caseloads. Lots of work, lots of things you're doing, probably very familiar to some of you folks that also work in child welfare. And I dealt with a, a lot of child welfare um, folks when we were dealing with our juvenile clients. You know, we have kids come in. My, my primary job was to go down to the jail every day and interview our new clients and, you know, just tell them what they're charged with and what's going on and what's going to happen to them in the system. And honestly, it was kind of uh, overwhelming for me because I barely understood the system, too. So, you know, you're trying to counsel someone going through the system. So that's when I, and it's kind of weird too, because at that time, I, I don't know where I got this from. I was always a process geek since I was a child. I like processes, I like organizations, that's what I deal with all my life, and how to improve them. And this is the first thing I realized on my job there, I needed to improve how I did processes, because I was overwhelmed. Uh, we had five attorneys, they were constantly busy, they were out of the office all the time, we had two secretaries. I received a little training. Maybe some of you folks may have had the same experience when you got into your new office, a little training. And then you were put or in there. Or no and, training. Or no training. Well, I was like, I got 15 minutes of training. Oh, that's great. So there you go. It's progress. Basically said, you know, all about confidentiality and don't talk about our clients outside the uh, law office. That's all you need to know. Apparently. Okay, perfect. <laughs> so anyway, so I'm thrown into this, and it's, it's overwhelming. We had 300, 400 cases a year with each attorney, and I was one of two paralegals. So you can imagine, my days were just filled. It was, it was the craziest summer I ever worked. And I spent a lot of time trying to improve the process, trying to improve how I did things, how to work with the cases, just as a survival, just so I could get through the day. So that's what I've been doing most of my life. So I've been in Social Security, I've been at uh, GSA, all these acronyms, all these large federal government agencies. I worked in Kentucky State um, Government, Environmental Protection Cabinet as a paralegal. And the whole common theme there was trying to improve how I did work and improve my processes. So I'm gonna, <coughs> excuse me there. I'm gonna stop here. How many of you all have had a great idea on how to improve your work? Okay. And did you, what did you do with that? Did you take it to your boss? 
And was it implemented? How many of y'all had your idea implemented? Doesn't matter how small, okay. Great, great. This is how, this is how Agile basically works, okay? And a lot of folks think it's gotta be this huge, big effort. In a lot of cases, Agile is just making small process changes or small improvements to what you're doing all day. But it's kind of funny because you, know, you, you think you come up with a great idea and you don't think it's that harmful or threatening or whatever, but you take it to your superiors and have you ever had the experience, and you don't have to raise your hand on this, but have you ever had the experience when they say to you, oh no, that's the craziest thing I've ever heard, stop coming up with stuff like that? Okay, it's all about the mindset that you have here. So this is the whole thing about my talk here. I was told not to get technical, and I'm a hardcore developer, but I told don't go technical. Real easy here because when you get down to Agile, Agile is not a bunch of tools and techniques. It is, it's a development philosophy, it's all this other stuff, but really when you get down to it, it's just about your mindset, okay? So I put up here a definition of mindset so we can all understand what that means. Does everyone agree with this? <coughs> okay, sorry about the coughing. I think I caught something coming up here. So the idea here with Agile is we're changing people's mindset, and there's a great book here, and I'm not, I don't get any kickback from it, but Lean Change Management, an excellent book to read. And the major point of it is, is we are out there when we are going Agile, we're getting people away from a plan-driven mindset. In other words, we have a perfect plan. And we're going to go with this plan, hell or high water, we're going to go with this plan, and we're going to succeed with this plan, and then there we are. So back there in the green room, we were talking, and I was trying to learn a little bit more about this, and I understand that you're all making a shift towards the well-being of the child. And I'm thinking, okay, that's great. How do you measure well-being of a child? What are the different measurements? How do you do this? So there were some frameworks, right? Plans, basically. Okay. So we got this plan. We're going to go and make this child well. We're going to you know, increase their well-being. And, that's, and the thing that got me about that is that how do I know the child has reached well-being? And the other thing that bothers me about that is at the end of the, pri at the plan, that's when we measure them for well-being, right? Do we measure their well-being in between as we're starting out? Or we just go with this plan and we hope that it gets delivered at the, you know, at what, delivered what we want at the end. Okay, and so to kind of jump into another topic, this is why a lot of federal IT projects fail, because we have this large plan to build this wonderful super system that'll solve all our problems. It's the silver bullet system. We give it to the contractors, the contractors go away and they build our super system and they come back and deliver it to us and it bombs, okay? Healthcare.gov. It's well, a yeah. example of that. This is why I'm taking annual leave so I can talk about this stuff, and I'm not a federal employee <laughs> right now. <laughs> I am, but I... Uh... <laughs> My day job, I work at the Patent and Trademark Office, but right now I'm off time, so I can talk about this, but exactly right. Healthcare.gov. We had a, a grand vision. We sent it to the contractors. They walked off, and they didn't deliver. There was another one. We just had a recent webinar on Agile Lean about the FBI, this case management system. They spent... <clears throat> millions of dollars, two major attempts to build a case management system. Finally, they switched to Agile. They actually got the case management system they wanted. Mm -hmm. About 10 years later, but they got what they wanted. Yeah. So that's the whole idea when here. When you go to lean change management or Agile, you're going to a feedback-driven mindset. Okay? So it's interesting. When I was sitting here listening to this, and I love this, so you got a kid in court. There's 11 people talking about them. Okay, they all got a plan. And the kid is sitting back here, well, who's going to ask me about the plan? This plan is happening to me. Um, do I get to talk about the plan? Do I get any feedback into this plan? You know? So with Agile, we're actually going now to the kid, and that's why I love that mobile app so much. We're going back here, and we're getting the feedback-driven mindset. So let me tell you what happens when you do go out there and give out new ideas, okay? And I've done this for a long time. And I have hit about every one of these. And let me tell you the first thing I learned Anger and bargaining, they're easy to see, and you can handle that resistance, and you know at least they're resisting you. The passive resistance, that's the worst thing to see. I've had things where I thought, oh, okay, everyone agrees with me now. You know, silence means consent. No, they were just in denial, and they're all depressed. There's a lot of, a lot of, <laughs> a lot of head shaking right now. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, this is the stage of the resistance to change. And the biggest thing that you'll run into is the whole bargaining thing. So we get folks here, and well, you're crazy, and this is, you know, we've got anger, denial, and such. Now let's just bargain it, okay? So I'm going to give you a few personas here, 
And I like what Kurt said to me, well, all your personas are very negative. Can you give us a positive one? I will give you a positive one at the end, I promise. But I'm going to show you these because you've probably heard all of these. There's the perfectionist mindset. Okay, so you go up to this person, you've got that great idea, you've got this great innovation, this process, you want to do something different. And they say, no, we've got a plan. Um, everything we need to know is in the plan. Let's just go with the plan. You know, why are you deviating from the plan? Okay? And I like this. You'll hear this. Uh, there's a phrase in there we call it minimum viable product. And it's just a test product and such. We're going to pilot it. The product is not going to be that great never. What, you know, it's, it's going to be a lot of chunky problems with it and such. And that's what drives some people crazy. They say, well, this is not a good thought out process. And in Agile, that's okay because you're working, you're kind of iterating, you're moving towards a solution, you're kind of working with it, and you gotta get that feedback. When I talk to my boss, I tell them the first three prototypes are gonna be pure crap. You're gonna hate them. I'm trying to figure out what the problem is. I'm trying to get a reality check here. I'm trying to figure out what we need to do, and without the feedback, all I'm doing is just guessing. You know, it's like, again, with the kid in the court there with the 11 plans, uh, I mean, the 11 parents and the whole big plan there, what if they just actually sat down with them and we said, let's just build a plan together, and they get feedback from the kid. The first three or four attempts at it, the kid will hate it. But we'll start iterating towards something we can work with. So that's the whole idea here. But that's kind of the common argument. How many there. of you are guilty of having this mindset? We have a lot of perfectionists in this field. It's okay, you can raise yeah, your hands. That's okay. I'm guilty of it. Uh, I want a quick story. I, I mean. At the White House Hackathon, we had six hacking teams, right? Each charged with a particular task to hack on a challenge. And then during that process, a seventh team emerged, sort of like the Shadow Ninja team. And they came up to me and, and they said, oh, dude, we, we just came up with a great idea. I know it's not part of the plan, it's not part of the script, but here, we're doing this data viz, it's really awesome. And me, I'm such a planner and perfectionist, so I was like, I'm sure it's a great idea. We'll, we'll make sure there's a space to showcase it, but we, don't have, we can't put you on the stage. You know, we, we didn't get approval. It's not part of the script. I don't think we'll have time. And I said, I'm sorry. I'm sure it's great, but we can't present it. I never told you that, six, though. I am so glad they ignored me. Yes. <laughs> because they it presented awesome. it on the stage the next day, and it was the, one of the most inspiring hacks of that whole pro process. I, I put him on stage. I didn't know you told him not you to. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, and I have, to, I have to recognize that. I have to recognize my own sort of failures and challenges in the, in the perfectionism space and how that can inhibit innovation. And it almost did if it wasn't for someone like Sigurd to say, ignore what he did, just go ahead and do it. Um, and because... Uh, so I think this is a mindset we, some of us carry that we need to be mindful of uh, to let go and don't let perfectionism be the enemy of right. the good. And it, it, this is a great example here. It's, this is not a light switch. I don't just, hey, I'm going to be agile today. It doesn't mm. work. You've got to work with it, and you've got your own instincts, and sometimes you have to say, okay, I'm not really cool with this, but let's try it anyhow and give it a shot. And then, you know, it kind of leads into the controller mindset, all right? These are the folks that... Well, if we deviate from the plan, we're losing control, and we need to make sure we have control. And I, I saw in the map, you know, in your app there, there's a lot of checklist. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of things you've got to go through. Mm -hmm. And we've got to be accountable, and I certainly agree. We've got to be accountable. We've got to watch for the security for the child. We've got to watch for the, make sure the child is taken care of and all that. And that's, those things are important. But a lot of folks will just cling to those and say, but this is why we can't deviate. We've got to control this process, because if we don't, then the child might do something crazy or someone might do something crazy to the child. You know, we gotta, we gotta just control this in much. And as, as I think it's kind of funny when you talked about that. Um, when you bring the child in, you know, you give the people the training, mm -hmm. and then all the rules just go out the window mm -hmm. because you're dealing with an actual child. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they're not too easily to control, right? Not most of them. <laughs> then we have the old guard mindset. And this one I see a lot in agencies, uh, especially with career folks, because we've always done it this way, this is the way we've always done it, it always worked in the past, and we should keep doing this. I agree sometimes with this, sometimes I disagree with this, let me tell you why. A lot of folks come in that are young and new and want to do all this crazy exciting stuff, and they just say, oh, we don't like the old ways, they're kind of boring and such. The first thing I told a lot of these folks is understand why we have those, mm -hmm. those ways, and why we do that, and those processes, and really dig into it and have a conversation with people, because I mean, you know, and, and I don't want to get to generational divides, but we get a little millennials coming in. I'm Generation X. I kind of understand a little better than our baby boomer folks, but I can see it in the meetings when everyone is yelling about, you know, why are we doing this this way? Why are we doing that way? And, you know, you guys, you've been doing it for years like this. Sometimes it makes sense to do it this way. Sometimes it doesn't. But just don't let the old guard sometimes say to you, well, we've always done it this way. 
we need to keep doing it this way because things are changing. But I just want to make sure we call a halt, and I love it, it's the name of a book, calling a halt to mindless change. Okay? So in Agile, Agile just doesn't mean throw out everything and start over again. Agile sometimes means let's just question what we're doing. Mm-hmm. Project I worked on at Office Personnel Management, I was there for a while, we looked at our reports that we had to produce. We, uh, we wanted to get rid of a lot of reports we had to produce, so we had a list of 17. And I would go to these offices and say, well, well, why do you use this report? Well, Congress demands it. Okay, and what does Congress do with it? Well, we send it to them twice a year, and I think one of their staffers reads it. And I, okay, and then what else do they do with it? Well, I don't know. They just, they just want the report. Well, what if we stop sending them the report? Would they notice? <laughs> you know? I mean, what is it? Is it influencing any legislation? Is it influencing any policy? Well, and when they asked the staffer, they said, oh, yeah, we just file those. So, okay, let's kill that report then. Okay, we just saved ourselves some time. I mean, you know, it's that kind of thinking. We do things and we do stuff and we provide information. Do we keep having to do that? You know, one thing in Agile is constantly question, what are you doing? Why are you doing it? A lot of times you have a good reason. Sometimes you don't. Then we had the last in line mindset. This is one I see and it's kind of interesting when you talked about your mobile app, how many of y'all are using that? And so are you guys the first ones to create this mobile app? Um, there, there are others. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, Scooter, stop being so modest. <laughs> that is this comprehensive and looks like that? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Go right. to Google or Google Play and put in false security, mm-hmm. and you're gonna get some crazy stuff. So how's it how's it feel to be the what pioneer? He said. Um, I mean, it's 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 awesome, I guess. I mean, yeah. for me, it, the focus has really been, what can this do for my children if if you know, they were still in care. That is constantly sort of front of mind, and anybody yeah. who's sat with me in my office knows that. Mm-hmm. I'm constantly asking those kinds of questions. And everyone jumped on the board right away, right? No, absolutely okay. not. <laughs> I had a boss one time tell me when I was trying to pioneer something, he said, you know how you can tell the pioneers? They're the ones lying in the ground with the arrows in their back. <laughs> had that idea, that mentality. He did not want to be first in anything. Mm-hmm. Let someone else try it, let them prove it works, then we'll go into it. So. With Agile, sometimes you have to go out there and try something new. And, you know, yeah, you'll be a pioneer, so you'll be an easy target. And you may have those failures, and they may be uh, very, you know, large. Can I ask you about your failures? Did you have any failures on this? Uh, yeah, we had a few. Had yeah. a few? Um, it mainly centered around design, not mm-hmm. necessarily execution. We, we partnered with a technology partner to get the back end and that kind of stuff done. But understanding that, you know, the groups of people we had involved had their own thinking of what a transitional checklist should look like or Mm -hmm. how it should feel or Mm -hmm. how we should approach education. And so, you know, when we began to include enough of each, everybody was sort of satisfied. But when we took too much of what the youth thought and too much of what the workers thought, then somebody always left, you know, as my son says, in their feelings. Okay. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I like that. Too much what the youth thought, too much what the uh, other stakeholders thought. You know, why are we letting the customers drive this again? Yeah. We're kind of moving towards that plan again. You know, what do the customers know? Mm-hmm. So you, you see these kind of different mindsets, and the positive persona I brought to you for is the growth mindset. So when you looked at these, all these mindsets are all around, and the whole plan-driven mindset is around the fixed mindset. So great book on this. If you haven't read it, it's a wonderful book to read. And the whole idea behind the fixed mindset is that we come into this world with a fixed set of talents, Uh, We don't develop from that. We, you know, everything, the best thing we need to do in this world is optimize and, you know, just make things safe and work with what we got, okay? And that's the whole thing with the fixed mindset here, and that's why it doesn't work well with Agile, because with Agile, challenges and mistakes and, you know, failures are great ways to learn, right? Now, and I had a friend of mine the other day uh, write a column, a really good column in GovTech, about, you know, agencies really need to embrace failure. And I wrote in there and I said, well, it's not really failure that we need to do a lot of because we're doing pretty good with that so far. <laughs> but <laughs> it's learning from our mistakes. Yeah. I was in a start, I was in a dot com, a startup dot com many years ago, uh, just before all the dot coms blew up. And we failed all the time. We made mistakes all the time. And we never learned from our mistakes. So of course we went out of business and I have a bunch of stock options I can't sell. You know, so it's not to fail, it's to basically learn from your failures. And that's the whole thing about the growth mindset here and the whole idea in agile thinking. So let me leave you the few things here, seven key takeaways for you. Understand the mindset you're reaching. And one of the big things is, is don't go to the person that has that fixed mindset and say, well, you're a fixed mindset, so shut up. 
you know, don't talk to me. You know, you've got to learn why are they thinking this? Why are they saying this? Sometimes they have a good reason. Maybe the old guard says we do it this way because this is always the way we've been doing it because it's tied into our funding this way and it's tied into this. And if we had to change, it would disrupt so many other systems. Try to understand first. Understand the mindsets. I also realize that people are more afraid of losing things than they are gaining things. Very, very afraid of losing things. Psychological experiment after one after another just shows this. Also, and I like this again, just came, beware of the implications. Again, this is some of the things, and I pick on the millennials, but when they come in there and they're all happy and ready and enthusiastic, and they start with the bureaucrats, as they call them, and they say, well, you guys are just too old. You're just too ingrained. You don't understand. You don't understand technology. And, you know, be careful of that kind of stuff, because I know there is the generational picture and there's the actual individual picture. And I know some baby boomers that are an amazing technologist. They're way up on it, been using it for all their life, and I know some millennials, and I teach college students. And I've taught thousands of college students. Not every one of them is computer savvy. <laughs> I can really attest to that. There's many, many a nights I've been on the phone ask, actually telling them how to make a file folder. And you're supposed to be the digital generation. Okay. So don't just treat people by generations. Look at them individually. Eating your own dog food. So do you use this app as yourself at your work? I'm sorry? Do you use this app yourself at work? Um, I have youth using it, yeah. And okay. I use the foster parent app as an adoptive parent. Yeah. Perfect, yeah. A lot of companies, it's, it's always kind of funny. Organizations go out there and they have these inter interesting innovations and such. And the first thing I say is, do you use it yourself? Do you work with it yourself? Are you using that process? Because if you're not, why should I trust you? <laughs> also, beware of the agile myths. Now, you guys, if you go agile and you say that, there's a whole consulting industry that's going to come around and start selling you stuff. And they're going to tell you things like Scrum and all these weird acronyms and everything. And they're going to... Again, when I tell folks, when you're working with Agile, don't worry about the tools and techniques. There's lots of them to choose from. There's lots of good experts and such. But the biggest thing about Agile is I always ask people, what are you trying to accomplish? What are you trying to achieve here? Because Agile will help you achieve your goal. But if you don't know what your goal is, you can spend a lot of time in Agile, spending a lot of money on consultants and time, and never get anywhere. Mm -hmm. Okay, Because you have to be very focused. Agile is iterative. It's rapid. But if you don't have a real good goal, um, the best analogy I give folks is when I was in college, we took a spring break. I don't know how we got talked into this. A friend of mine said, let's go out in the car, and every time we come to a crossroads, we'll flip up a stick, and wherever it's pointing, we'll go that way. Worst three days of my life. We went all over the place. We got lost in Kentucky. We, got, we didn't know where we were. Finally, I just said, I'm leaving, and got out of this, because we had no goal, no destination. We didn't know what we were doing, and things just happened, and it didn't work. Well. And that's the craziest spring break ever. Also, Agile is about learning. Remember, we're always learning. If you're not learning, if you're not learning stuff from it, you're not doing Agile right, okay? Last piece is Agile theater. A lot of people I go to, they say they're doing Agile. They say, oh yeah, we've got these great tools and techniques <coughs> and such, but they're still plan driven. Mm. And they're still not really doing the Agile because they're not learning and they're not listening to the customer. Right. The quickest test to see if someone is doing Agile correctly or if they really are doing Agile, what did your customers say about this? What did your stakeholders say about this? What kind of feedback can you show me on this final product you created? So, you guys are welcome to join the conversation with us on the Agile list. I'd love to have more people come on there. And let's get, um, we have a lot of techies on there. I'd like to get folks that are not techies to kind of help us because Agile can be used anywhere. And it can be used in a lot of non-technical fields. I use it in training right now. So if you guys would like to join us, please feel free. Love to have you. Great. Awesome. Thank you, Bill. Mm -hmm. you so um, I, I, love, I love the growth mindset work and what's being done there. Um, and you know, one of the, the things I read once that really resonated with me is um, it was a father talking about his, his child. And rather than saying, what do, you, what do you want to do when you grow up, he asked, what problems do you want to solve when you grow up? Mm -hmm which is a growth mindset way to ask your child what he wants to do when he grows up. I mean, that's a question we can ask ourselves. What's your title? What's your job? And we spit out our title. And another way to ask is, what problems do you solve every day? Because it will really transform and help you reevaluate the kind of work you're doing. You also said something about when you run up to some of these tough mindsets. Oh, yeah. What do you do? Because we have these people that we work with. 
They might be our bosses, or not my boss, by the way. <laughs> um, and I don't know what, how to do that. Well, how to, you know, and so you, su you suggested, you know, don't just fight them, you know, develop some empathy. And, and six, I want to challenge you on this, because one thing you, you say often, you said this at the White House, is you said this at the end of the White House event, you said, either lead, follow, or get out of the way. Mm -hmm. And you know, and I don't know if that's the right way to do, because is there a, a fourth option where you say, actually, let me sit here and try to empathize and understand where you're coming from? I mean, do we need to spend time doing that, or should we say, lead, follow, or get out of the way? And I think it's a balanced approach, but I mean, sometimes you really have to either lead follow or get out the way. And I think that is, it just boils down to it when it comes down to young people and, and, and getting results. In Santa Clara, um, we're in Santa Clara County right now, working with, um, to integrate our Unify app into their stack list, all that stuff. And we have had to meet with over 50 people um, who all play different types of roles from you know the director of child welfare, social services, probation, all the way down to the people who will actually be using the app on a daily basis. So that is a form of us you know, really bring people to the work um, because there is that work to do. But in order to make moves sometimes, you are gonna have to think about when do I have to make a choice? And we are faced with difficult choices every day. I'm not gonna sit here and wait for this entire room to all for all of us to agree that technology needs to be integrated into child welfare. You're either gonna help us, you're gonna lead with us, you're gonna follow, or we're gonna get out the way. Let's talk a little bit about. <laughs> I'm still not sure about that. Um, but it relates to the, the, my next question, which is why is all of this so hard to do? Like, why, why are the Apples and Googles able to just innovate and spit out apps like every 10 seconds, really good ones? Like, why is it hard to do in our space and what we're dealing with? Like, is it a tech thing? Is it a people thing? Is it a bureaucracy thing? Like, what exactly is getting in the way that prevents us from innovating and accelerating new ideas in a way that other agencies can do it all the time? People don't get out the way. No, I'm just joking. Okay, maybe that's, that's not it. it. That's not it. Um, when we think about technology, one of the most powerful ways of using technology is to automate a process so that it's more efficient, so that we unlock something beyond human capability. The thing, though, is that when we apply technology to child welfare, is that we start automating things that are already broken, so we only get to the broken thing just mm -hmm. 10 times quicker. Mm -hmm. um, so when I think about what's needed in our tools, we have a lot of applications that are about giving information. Where is this? How do I get this? But where are the tools that redefine the way we do things? How do you get behavioral change? When we look at Slack, when we look at Uber, they have, they have changed the way you take transportation. They have changed the way you communicate. So how do we bring software into our industry that helps people change their behavior in a way that it feels comfortable and at a rate that they can absorb that change? I think from, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. Um, from, a, from a technology development standpoint, a large part of it is the apps that you talk about, like, you know, Uber spent years developing this app with people, human-centered design, design, right? Like being close to the experience that they want to have. And you know, the, those original groups with Uber, with some other things, they still ride Uber for free because it is almost a part of their job to consistently talk about how we can sharpen this pencil over and over again and make it better. I think in government and agent, large agencies especially, we sort of feel like sometimes we're just stuck with what we have. You know, when I came into um, DC CFSA, tons of people needed new computers. And then I go to a room and there's over 100 new computers. And so one of the things I did was gave people new computers. You would have thought I split the atom. But, <laughs> you know, it, 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 there, there is a need that was met, but people oftentimes in large bureaucracies just have this idea, well, this is all I can get, so mm -hmm. I'm just gonna sit and I'm gonna deal with it. Yeah. Uh, if I can tell a recent story, I just finished a major project redesigning an entire program tracking form. I don't wanna get into details, it's boring, but one of the big things was it was a PDF form that we had on SharePoint and we would share it around and people would fill it out and email it back and forth. Craziest process, I hate that kind of thing. And I came in there and I said, let's redesign this using what we have, the tools we have, and our first design session, we got in there and people wanted to recreate the form. 
and SharePoint, and we got all these collaborative technologies and such here, and we're paying tons of money for it. And I said, get away from the form, think about the process again, I'm getting, being process geek, but get away from the old process, and what do you really want to do with this? How do you, what, is, what do you really want to get out of this? How can we redesign this to make it more effective? So get away from that old way of thinking. So it's exactly right. A lot of times I see in government is another big problem. We call in a software contractor and we say, we want to automate this process, and we never actually examine the process in the first place. So when I talked to you guys backstage, I was saying, okay, I, I did this for USDA. We looked at the rural and farm economy, and we just mapped out all the different places and everyone that dealt with it, all the stakeholders, and just the process. So it's like the journey map you created. Just to understand what is it at the process now, and we've got new tools and technologies, how can we make this process better? And the, the, the worst thing you can do is take a process that is broken and automate it because you're just going to make it faster and more ineffective. And I just see us at agencies a lot. So with Agile, you really got to get people in there, and I love this, so you know, we're going to get, kick them out of the room if they don't leave. Not kick them out, out the room. But, but, yeah, but you got to get down and sit down and say, look, you got to think about this in a new way and be open to challenging what's going on, okay? Classic example was when, um, back when we had um, South Central Bell, or, you know, the whole Bell Telephone Network, they had the engineers come in, and this is what helped lead to the, the invention of the internet. They had engineers come in and think about if the telephone system disappeared overnight, what would we do to replace it? And I mean, a lot of times, think about it. They go in the office sometimes and say, if this system disappeared overnight, what, we could do, what could we do to replace it? And start from there, see what happens. Okay. You, Thank you. Oh, sorry. sorry, Emily. I was gonna, I had something to add to that, uh, why, you know, the Silicon Valley tech companies succeed more. Um, there's two things, and one is that focus on customer user experience that we've been talking about. Um, and there's a, and you know, being open to agile and failure, there was an expression that one of the, the head designers at Facebook for a while often used, which was move fast and break things. Um, so doing it as quickly as possible and, and failing fast so that you can learn more. And then the other thing is um, that growth mindset and the openness to innovation and encouragement of innovation in these places. So like at Google, um, employees there get uh, what's called 20% time. So they have 20% of their time every week is allowed to be used on any kind of personal project that could help um, drive the work that's being done within Google. And actually within my program, we have the same rule. So I get uh, eight hours a week to scrub in on other projects, help out other colleagues on things, or seek out other projects, uh, potential projects for PIF. And that's how a lot of really amazing things got started. So we had two PIFs last year, fellows, who um, were embedded with an agency and um, in their 20% time, um, they decided they wanted to, uh, to do some innovative work around police data. And they started the police data initiative on their own in this 20% time, and it ended up taking off. And they've still been working on this for the last year. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a, another aspect of these, these companies is like they, they make room for it, and they have that, that open-mindedness, basically. Yeah, one of the mentors and, and we had at the White House Hackathon was on sabbatical from Microsoft. He was a foster parent and also a Microsoft programmer, and they had a similar program where it says, we want to give you time and space to go out and do some social good and use the, the, the resources that we have and the expertise and training we've given you and your own skills to go out and do good. And he spent half that time working at the White House on this hacking team, and I, I think it's a great example of something that we could do in our agencies um, to get our bosses to, to do that, but uh, to create that space where you can change and test things out and not always succeed, but at least you test them out and start to move the envelope and push it a little bit. Mm -hmm. We only have like one minute left, so, um, or zero minutes left, so um, I wanted to thank everyone for, for being here. Um, I hope this was uh, useful and informative for you. Thank you. Um, we have some time for a break before we see the Olympic gold medalists and others speak, uh, um, but I th I'm willing and able to be here for a little bit more if people want to have questions or comments, and um, I'm sure the other panelists will do that too. So thank you so much for your time and attention. Yeah, awesome. All right. <laughs>